Hola. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the executive course on being an evaluator in a training and research context, the importance of peer review. My name is Cairo. I'm from Malaysian Qualifications Agency. This is a bit about my background. I graduated from Waseda University in Japan in the year 2000, and then I graduated for my master's and PhD from Kanazawa University, also from Japan, before I continued on with my postdoctorate. And I came back to serve University of Tanaga National in 2007 before my current post at Malaysian Qualifications Agency as the Deputy CEO since 2019. My research work includes robotics and also higher education policies. So these are just some of my uh, example of my work in research. On the left, we have the radiation mapping uh, done autonomously by a mobile robot. And on the right, we have a close manipulation robot using industrial type robots, a dual manipulator that can actually autonomously do clothes handling and clothes folding. On top of that, we also work on uh, inspection type robots for our parent company, Tanaga National Berhad, which is the national utility, uh, electricity utility company. And we, we help them to develop practical robots for inspection purposes. See, these are just some of the list of the robots that we have developed so far. We have inspection type robots, we have home service robots, and we also work on machine learning, AI, and also deep learning. And we also develop other types of robots as well. So if you are interested to collaborate with us, please do by all means drop me an email uh, later. And I will public, uh, publication wise, so I've uh, published in uh, top tier journals such as the IEEE Transaction on Auto uh, Automation Science and Engineering, uh, IEEE Transaction on Industrial Electronics, Advanced Robotics, International Journal of Advanced Robotic Systems, and, and so on. So I've published more than 190 papers so far uh, and have the H index of 26 and number of citations of about 2,596. So on the right, we have this is a newspaper cutting or clipping from an exhibition that we participated and had the privilege to explain our work to our Deputy Prime Minister back then in 2017. And I've also had the privilege of being invited and served as keynote speakers, as uh, I was also uh, in, in TV, in, uh, invited to appear on TV. And these are just some of the uh, benefits of being, uh, you know, uh, visible due to the works of being peer evaluators. And to top it all, I was very privileged to be appointed as chairperson on the development of our national robotics roadmap. So this is the initiative by the Ministry of Science, Technology and Innovation back in 2020 and 2021. So we had crafted the roadmap for our nation uh, for 10 years, and we hope that we can bring uh, robotics at par with the rest of the world. So my experience as the peer evaluator and reviewer, I've experienced being reviewer for journal and conference papers, including manuscripts from IEEE transactions and magazines, LCV journals, IEEE conferences, including flagship conferences, such as the IEEE conference on robotics and automation, or ICRA, and also IROS. I've also served as external examiner for both master and PhD thesis, internally and externally. External evaluator for promotion of academic staff. This is generally for external uh, other universities. And auditor for accreditation of programs appointed by our quality assurance agency. External examiner advisor for programs appointed by universities to help them advise them on how to improve the, uh, their programs. Auditor for institutional audits. This is uh, appointments by the ministry to audit institutions. And uh, I also had the privilege to become an auditor for International External Quality Assurance Agency, uh, which, is, which was appointed by the Regional Quality Assurance Network in ASEAN, which is the ASEAN Quality Assurance Network. So what is our peer review about? So peer review is about process of getting feedback evaluation from peers usually about the, the validity, quality, and often the originality of articles for publication or presentation in conferences. 
Uh, its ultimate purpose is to maintain the integrity of knowledge by filtering out invalid or poor quality articles. The currency, technique, and ability of one's teaching abilities is also uh, subject to peer review. The quality of proposal for award of research grants, scientific, and also teaching awards. The readiness of an academic for promotion to the rank of professors, associate professors, and so on. The validity, quality, and often the originality of thesis and whether it meets the requirements for conferment of a master's or PhD degree and also the quality of program being offered in a particular institution or the institution itself. So these are maybe just some of the examples of modes and modalities of peer review. So on in this particular presentation, I'm try, I will try to as much as possible cover items one, two, uh, five, and six. Whereas actually uh, the basic principle and also philosophy of peer review covers basically all, all six items here. So introduction-wise, what is the importance of peer review? As I explained earlier, this is about getting constructive feedback about how your article thesis should be and how you can improve your work and your progress of your career. So your teaching abilities and how you can further improve them, the quality of proposal application and how you can improve them in the future to be able to secure a grant, a promotion, and so on, and the quality of a program offered or the institution itself, and how you can further improve your program and also your institution. So how to be selected as an evaluator or assessor for peer review? Of course, the most important thing is to be visible. And how do you, be, do you get visibility? Is through your research work and publications, through your positions that you hold, at your university or in professional bodies such as IEEE and also learned societies. So you need to be visible among your peers and usage of social media such as LinkedIn, Facebook and so on and also having your personal website might also help you in, in getting that visibility. And of course, as a, as a researcher, as an academician, we, we should always attend conferences with the intention of not only presenting your paper but also to get that visibility through networking okay and and then these are maybe baby steps on for you to become invited uh, as plenary and also as keynote speakers as invited speakers so attending conference is very important for networking and also for getting feedback on how you should improve your work so let's go with the peer review of research first so uh, I think this is the pinnacle of uh, what we do as an academician. We always write papers and we also, also review papers. So the evaluation of manuscript by peers is important in ensuring novelty and credibility of new knowledge that you would like to present to the masses. So the peer-reviewed publications depend on impartial assessments from experienced researchers to guarantee the excellence of the content that they publish and the collaborative effort of reviewers in a, in a particular scientific or uh, art domain are essential for upholding the standards of both journals or conferences and the field of interest. And the viewpoints of reviewers regarding aspects such as the relevance, the suitability of techniques, the proper methods for data analysis and presentation, and the level of rigor or speculation acceptable in data interpretation essentially establish the accepted standards within the field. Okay, and the assessments establish more subtle benchmarks for professional conduct, ethics, and collegiality. This influence is not limited to their decisions on paper acceptance or rejection, but extends to the tone of la and language used in their reviews and the consideration they give to their ethical and professional duties as reviewers. And what do uh, the editors in journals and also maybe um, conference chairs look at when they appoint reviewers? So number one, they look at the expertise in one or more areas of the paper. In conflict of interest, you must, not, you must declare your conflict of interest. Good judgment, ability to think clearly and logically, ability to write a good critique which is accurate, readable, and also helpful to editors and also the authors in improvising and making decisions on whether to accept the paper or not. Reliability in returning reviews and also the ability to review 
in the allotted time frame. So these are very important uh, aspects the editor actually look at. For example, when you are given or you are offered, uh, being uh, invited to review that reliability of returning uh, and you accept the reviews, whether you have 100% uh, compliance in returning all the reviews and whether you deal with, whether you do them in the stipulated time frame that is actually uh, set by the publisher or by the journal or by the conference. So this is where, these are very uh, qualities that editors look at when they uh, look after reviewers. And from the editor's point of view, the ideal reviewer are researchers who are working in the same discipline as the subject of the paper, okay, will understand the hypothesis underlying the work, familiar with the model systems and methods used in the project, and be able the ability to judge the quality of data analysis and assess the validity of the conclusions, and be able to assess the significance of the work. So of course, this is ideal reviewer if a person suits uh, fit nicely into the scope of work he or she will be able to advise the editors on whether to accept or not to accept the paper and what are the improvements that the authors need to do in order for the manuscript to be accepted by the journal or by the conference and questions to consider when deciding whether to review a paper uh, this is you when you are getting an invitation so do you actually have the appropriate expertise? So as I explained earlier, ideal uh, reviewers are what the editors are looking after. But of course, normally, ideal reviewers seldom exist. So editors often will often send papers to multiple reviewers with different areas of expertise and different perspectives. So you might not have the entire uh, expertise in that particular uh, in the area of the work but you may actually have partial expertise in some of the sub areas in the work which you can contribute in providing your expert opinions to the journal or to the conference so young reviewers tend to underestimate their expertise so perhaps you have to be confident in what the ability that you can provide uh, justice and also good review and good feedback to the edit to the journal and also to the authors but of course whenever in doubt please contact the editor and discuss your concerns so at any point you can always feel free to contact or communicate with the editor or with the um, technical chair of the conference to discuss your concerns and be mindful when revi uh, when reviewing a manuscript reviewers should be aware and be of the ethical issues and problems uh, at the point of deciding whether to review a manuscript or not when reviewing the manuscript and after submission of the reviews. And to be a good reviewer, one must understand that the, this peer review process and the role of the reviewer. And you should not accept the review task if there is a conflict of interest, which can include institutional affiliations, collaborators and colleagues. Maybe the papers come from your collaborators and colleagues and other relationships with the authors such as uh, you are the, a family member you are a friend or maybe people that you do not like or detest so of course some of the times the manuscript come to you uh, without the name of the authors it's blind review but at certain point of th at, at, at certain times you may actually guess the the manuscript is a work of maybe person who are listed here who have, you have conflict of interest uh, in. And in that case, you should uh, decline, uh, politely decline the review because you have conflict of interest. So that's very important to uphold that integrity and professionalism in ensuring that your review is impartial and is not influenced by uh, feelings and by, by other type, uh, you know, by other emotions and so on. And other conflict of interest includes patent and license agreements, financial support if you're actually uh, involved directly in funding the research or you, you receive funding from a particular company uh, involved in the work and so on. Uh, and also, please make sure that you, uh, if you have uh, strong personal beliefs in certain things such as you, know, you are against stem cells uh, or against abortion and the paper is related to that and you have you know 
uh, your uh, belief in certain things and you do not want to me would not want to actually review the paper okay so these are just some of the other types of conflict of interest that you may want to also consider when uh, considering whether to accept or not a review process so once you agree to review how do you handle the paper so of course manuscripts under review are confidential documents they contain unpublished data and ideas which must be kept confidential you might you cannot share the paper or its contents with your colleagues and manuscripts should be kept in a secure place okay so this is uh, just some of the things that you have to be very mindful when you handle the manuscripts remember confidentiality is in, is very very critical you cannot use the information in the paper in your own research or cite it in your own publications until the journal or the conference has actually published the paper so this can raise serious ethical issues if the work provides insights or data that could benefit your own thinking and studies not only the paper but also the outcome and content of the review are confidential so lapses in the confi uh, confidentiality undermine the review process we betray the trust of the authors and the editors and can create serious problems for everyone involved in the reviews so remember guys confidentiality is critical you have to make sure that you uphold this confidentiality at all times when you do your review process you are again appointed by the journal and you are not the friend of the author so new reviewers often empathize with the authors of the manuscript they review it is sometimes difficult to adopt a more institutional perspective and to realize that the reviewer's primary role is to advise the journal and not to help the author publish the paper. So you need to be very, very uh, mindful of this as well. So a reviewer may feel bad about rejecting a paper and, and empathize with the authors, but you must remember that you, uh, you must be able to make that recommendation for rejection when it is the appropriate one to be done. Okay, so you have to be very professional in, in uh, deciding or giving your views on whether the manuscript or the paper is acceptable or not. And a seriously flawed paper must be challenged at all times. The reviewer must remember that it is unethical to allow a badly flawed paper to pass unchallenged into the peer-reviewed literature well, it will be a trap for readers who are unsophisticated and they will just simply read the manuscript superficially and simply accept the flawed conclusions at face value. So this is very, very important, guys. You have to make sure that no flawed paper is, uh, is allowed to go through and being published. Okay, so this is to uh, uphold the integrity and the professionalism of our field. And when you write the review, they must be clear, concise, and accurate, okay? Uh, although the primary purpose is to advise the editor and to provide comments to the author, okay? So comments to the author frequently are of value in guiding the revision of the paper for the same or for a different journal and suggesting ways to improve the work. Comments to the author may be very brief, especially when they are very, very excellent papers. Okay, and they uh, may be extensive if the reviewer feels the paper has valuable elements but requires extensive revisions to present the findings effectively. So you may want to guide your peers, uh, the authors, in improving the paper so eventually, so that eventually it will be accepted either by that particular journal or maybe a different journal. Okay, and the reviewer should remember that the review will be sent to the authors and that it should be written in a constructive and collegial tone. The content should be constructive and informative. The comments and recommendations should be clear and should be supported with citations to specific areas in the text of the paper. And when the reviewer's criticisms rely on or are supported by data in the literature, the reviewer should provide citations to the relevant papers. And a good review should help the authors to think more clearly about their work and its design, execution, presentation, and significance. Okay, and it's very important at the end of the day that the researchers, the reviewers receive appropriate credit for their reviews because it allows them to develop a track record in the peer review process. 
it adds on to the review uh, the new reviewers to adds the new reviewers to the journal's database so it add ons to the journal's database for facilitating future invitations to review papers it builds on the reviewers professional network they became no become known to the uh, editors it increases the reviewers visibility so journals list and thank reviewers in journal and on journal and society websites okay journal editors are often asked to recommend committee members speakers and study session members for the journals so they might want to choose you if you are a, a good and visible uh you know um, evaluator or um, reviewer and a solid track record of performance in the peer review process will enhance the visibility of a young researcher and enhance the development of his or her career so it's very very important that you do uh, reviews and you get credit for your work that you have uh, done and actually contributed to the journal or to the conference so that's about it in, in brief about uh, peer review of research. Now we go to the different aspect of peer review of teaching. So this is no less important than peer review for research because we need to also do peer review for teaching to enhance how we conduct our lectures and how we deal and engage with students. So what is actually peer review of teaching or PRT? So peer review of teaching is a confidential form of evaluation conducted by normally colleagues or peers. It is designed normally to provide feedback to the instructors, to the lecturers about their teaching. And the intention of this exercise is to normally assist in enhancing the teaching and learning culture of the department, school, faculty, or university. And this uh, peer review of teaching enables instructors or lecturers to observe and observers to reflect on their teaching practice. So not only the subject of the peer review is um, can reflect on the teaching but also the observers can actually learn a thing or two from the subject who they are peer reviewing so the collaborative efforts of reviewers in a particular science or art domain are essential for upholding the standards sorry uh, the prt is also known as peer evaluation uh, of teaching or peer uh, observation of teaching Okay, and formative assessment. So peers will be able to generate information for you about your teaching habits that you, ha you can use to improve your teaching and your students' learning. So it is normally non-evaluative. Uh, and also this peer review of teaching can be based on triangulation of information, including reviews of teaching materials, classroom observations, getting feedback from students, among others. And it focuses on specific aspects of teaching to identify strength and strengths and opportunities for improvement, followed by a plan for continuous professional development. So you can get feedback and you can actually plan on how to get uh, to make yourself better through CPD or uh, continuous professional development. And it serves as a tool for the continuous development of effective teaching throughout a career. And remember that nowadays we have so many technologies out there so we have to also enhance the way we teach and the, the way we handle uh, students who come from different types of background now we have maybe we are more of uh, generation uh, x you know y and then the students now are generate uh, gen z and maybe some of them in the future in the very near future coming from alpha and beta so these are native uh, ai uh, students so they are native in ai the gen z is a native in um, native for uh, digital native so they are digital native uh, alpha and beta are ai native so there are different ways of how we should handle the students so we have to improve our teaching uh, and teaching te uh, pedagogy techniques from time to time okay and documentation can help foster better reflection as well as become evidence of that CPD. So there are many forms that we can use. Of course, uh, the institution, the department, uh, faculty can develop a peer review, peer evaluation form. So this is just an example. What is important is it has to be very, very objective. You need to have a proper rubric uh, to assess. 
Okay, and, and also it has to be constructive so that you can provide constructive feedback to the subject of review. And what are the challenges of peer review of teaching? So peer evaluations do not replace other forms of evaluation review of teaching. They serve as a component of a multifaceted approach of teaching evaluation. So it is subjective and can be biased if the criteria and standards are not made clear. So you need to have rubrics and so on to help you in doing this. Power relations and collegiality issues can also be a challenge. It can trigger anxiety and tension among those being subject of reviewer and also a subject of review and also the reviewer. So the uh, PRT process must be rigorous, open and transparent and done with integrity and care with the objective to improve the teaching and learning and support instructors and the lecturers to become a better lecturer. Administrators must also acknowledge the time and effort put into this peer review of teaching for it to serve its true purpose. So sometimes we tend to take this for granted, but I think peer review for teaching is as equally important as the peer review for research. And you can have a uh, uh, um, look at the, uh, you know, the references this, uh, and the work on, on journals and also conferences. There are many, many uh, good articles that you can read. So this is just an example of an article that you can read further about peer review in teaching. Okay, so now next, I would like to also share a bit about peer review for accreditation because I come from Malaysian Qualifications Agency, so we can share a bit about what is it, uh, what is peer review for the purpose of accreditation. So just to explain a bit about what is MQA, um, Malaysian Qualifications Agency was established in 2007 with the functions listed here. And I would like to highlight two important functions that we have, which is very, uh, very relevant to the content that, uh, topic today. The quality assure, to quality assure higher education institutions and programs, and to also accredit it, uh, to accredit courses that fulfill the set of uh, criteria and also standards. So in order to do this, we need or oh, we rely on peer reviews, we rely on assessors. So the quality assurance process in uh, MQA, or Malaysian Qualifications Agency, we look at the program's uh, quality through accreditation, and the process of accreditation are done in stages. We have provisional accreditation, we have full accreditation, and we have maintenance audit. We also have the institutional audit uh, in certain institutions that we do. Okay, especially when we are uh, evaluating them for self-accrediting status institutions. So these are just some of the uh, types of accreditation. Perhaps in, in your respective country, it can be slightly different. And we have also documents that are developed together with academicians and we, together with the experts to assist MQA in conducting our evaluation on our assessments and our accreditation exercise. So again, as, as an academician, you can also be involved in the uh, development of these kind of standards in your respective countries. And the most important document that we hold on in any accreditation of uh, programs is the Code of Practice for Program Accreditation, or we uh, also known as COPA. It has six sections, and inside that, there's also a section about the panel of assessors and how to prepare the report. Okay, so these are important guidelines that can be used by the institutions, the program owners, and also the assessors that are appointed by MQA. And these are just some of the areas for evaluation. So we have seven big areas for evaluation. Okay, so the uh, program development and delivery, student selection, academic staff, program management, educational resources, assessments of student learning, and also the entire program monitoring review and also CQI. So if you look at these areas of evaluation, what comes into mind is that as an assessor, you need to be well versed in all these areas as well. So we rely on academics and also subject matter experts. On top of that, we also rely on some practitioners and industrial players as well to give us feedback. But from a perspective of uh, normally academician, okay, what are the criteria of assessors? You have a higher uh, education qualification. 
you have that teaching experience, appropriate subject knowledge and teaching experience, knowledge on curriculum design and delivery, program leader or experience in management, you know, experience in research and scholarly activities. So you can see that we need a vast experience, rich experience in different aspects, and not only research, we'll also look at teaching, whether how you are contributing to your program in your respective institution as a leader or in management or in curriculum development and design. So these are very important for the peer review of uh, programs or also institutions. So you might also want to consider having an experience in these related areas in order for you to be selected as a peer reviewer for program and also institution uh, audits. Yeah? And we have a pool of more than 1,500 assessors across different types of domains. This is talking about Malaysia to assess more about 17,000 programs that we have in our register. And what are the benefits of peer evaluation of programs and institutions? Of course, for the institution, you have the uh, opinion expert evaluation of the program or your institution, and you can improve the program and your institution through the report that is provided by the reviewers or by the agency. And for the assessors, you can learn from the institutions being evaluated. You can also learn and the thing of two, similar with when you are appointed as a reviewer, peer reviewer for research and also teaching, you can also learn you can also learn from your subjects, yeah? from the subjects that who you are evaluating. And you can also uh, pick up uh, knowledge from fellow assessors, especially senior assessors, on how to actually conduct uh, audits. And it's also a recognition of a contribution towards quality of higher education. And for the higher education as a whole, of course, we have uh, quality programs and we have sharing of good practices among programs and among peers. So this is good for, uh, for the higher education landscape of your country and also for the world. And assignment of assessors, again, for us, it's very important uh, as to look at uh, the professionalism, ethics of the assessors, and whether they are suited to uh, evaluate the area or this, the program or the institution. So of course they have to undergo training, okay, and they have they are being selected based on their expertise level, and uh, of course we uh, this is also very important the one in red of course conflict of interest again uh, assessors who have conflict of interest they have to declare that they have conflict of interest and we will not then appoint these assessors to evaluate that particular program or institution, and we do uh, provide performance evaluation of assessors from both the institutions that they audit and also from our MQA officers to provide feedback on how they can improve themselves further from time to time. Okay, and the criteria of evaluation of the assessors, this is very similar perhaps from the aspect of an editor of a journal or uh, the technical chair of a conference. So we look at the quality of the report, the timeliness of the report, the knowledge on the uh, subject matter, procedures of the QA uh, documents, standards and policies, professionalism, ethics and discipline, personality, and also the communication skills, both in written and also oral form. Okay, so that's a bit about uh, peer review for accreditation. So the last part that I would like to share today is about the future of peer review itself. Because we have to understand that there's a, there are all these opportunities and challenges. The emergence of generative AI and large language models or LLM has provided both opportunities and challenges in the research and academic publications and work. Understanding and mastery of the tools can help both peer reviewers to anticipate and check the originality of the work being assessed or being evaluated. So you, uh, for example, as a researcher, as a supervisor for your students, you have to understand, or, or a lecturer, you have to understand the, what AI can actually do now. Because you have to embrace that and become good role models to your students and to your peers as well. So that when when you are well versed with what are the platforms available you may be able to do your review more uh, better 
okay, and be able to anticipate that whether the work is actually of um, actually originated from the authors or not. Okay, so this is very very important. So please be, uh, make sure that you are well versed. At least you know what these platforms are available in now, uh, especially when we talk about uh, AI. So even for research, uh, you have so many tools that we can use now. So they, these AI can actually help us in assisting us in conducting literature review to summarize papers, even to summarize certain math, mathematical equations, and be able to generate pseudocodes and codes uh, for programming. And they may be also used to list down references. And we have to be able to understand that some of these Although they are used, they might uh, AI might not be correct. Yeah. So these AI tools should only be used as tools and not as solution providers. So you have to understand that this is something that is so easy to use. Students may actually use them, but whether the outcome yeah, of the uh, uh, what is actually generated by AI is actually correct or not may not be so. So you have to be able to advise your students, be able to advise your peers that please use this uh, AI ethically and responsibly and do, use them as tools and not as solution providers. So we have so many types of uh, AI out there. For example, ChatGPT. ChatGPT can even be used now to generate image. Okay, not only uh, text, but we can also use ChatGPT, the uh, premium version of ChatGPT to generate image. And of course, there are so many things that uh, ChatGPT can do. So for example, I, I work and uh, I studied in Japan, so I can even type and prompt uh, ChatGPT in Japanese and you will be able to provide me with the uh, the draft answer in, in Japanese. And it's quite, quite, uh, impressive to be to be honest so but of course again you as a subject matter expert must be able to advise your students to advise your peers that to use this as uh, with caution because not everything that's generated by chat gpt is correct and the one you can see on the left chat gpt can also generate uh image using dal e uh in chat gpt plus and size space is another uh, type of example of uh, generative AI uh, using the large uh, language model, LNM. Uh, it can assist literature review, provide insights of papers, and auto generate questions to deep dive further and customize questions to get answers. So this is just the, uh, the what is uh, size space looks like. And it can summarize Give you a summary of the top five papers from the search and you can also provide you individual summary of the individual papers so it's very very useful in providing or in, in helping you to do literature review uh, of course you can also use size space to uh, suggest questions for you to dig further using the uh, uh, the co-pilot function you can also explain mathematical equations and tables that uh, may come as part of the uh, part of the um, suggestion yeah so so uh, part of the paper so you can use uh, size piece uh, in in this manner and of course what is important these are just two of the examples of uh, generative ai so in malaysia mqa malaysia qualifications agency we have actually issued an advisory note to the educators students and institutions on how they should use generative AI responsibly and ethically. So we are we we ask the institutions to uh, set up guidelines on how to use AI. Academic staff should be the role model to students. So so you sh yourself should also know how to use some of this AI. And the results generated using generative AI may not be accurate and requires verification. So it's very very important. For, for us to advise our students and our peers not to just simply trust the results generated using AI. And you can refer to these guidelines in our website. So as a summary, what is the, why is peer review important? Basically, just to summarize, it's good in getting constructive feedback about your work and how you can improve them. 
your teaching ability and how you can further improve them as well. And you can use this to also uh, feedback to improve your research grant proposals. And also if you are a program owner, a program leader, then the quality of the program offered or your institution can also be improved based on feedback from peer reviews. And then you as a uh, peer reviewer, you can also observe and learn good practices in other peers or students' work. Observe the, and learn uh, good practices in the programs and institutions that you audit. And you can also network with others. In all, this will definitely link to the progression in your career. So uh, before I end, I would like to acknowledge uh, these entities in uh, helping in, in the content of my presentations today. And some of the contents in this presentation were also generated and paraphrased using ChatGPT.